Lord, we bring ourselves before you this morning. Bring your word before you, Lord. Your word that you don't, it doesn't return to you empty, but it accomplishes everything you please. And whatever you say and have said to us through your word is still valid for today. Thank you for your, the power that is in your word. We love you, Lord, and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this is entitled Open Doors. It's like the song we sang, Open Skies. Open up the skies. But let's read this last two churches in the book of Revelation. If you are here for the first time or have not heard all of this, uh, we have some videos out. Um, if you look at our church page, Vineyard Chatsworth, Vineyard Church Chatsworth, and go like it and you'll find every kind of things going on there. It's free. And um, also, you'll catch up on some of the others. The Lord bless you. So let's read. We finished five churches, but today, the last two. Let's read Revelation 3, verse 7. It says, And to the angel of the church, as we said, the angel is the leader of the church or the pastor or, yeah. In Philadelphia, write these things, says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have and no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Look at having Jesus, this is Jesus speaking to his church. He still speaks to his church. It's his church, his people. He started this. He died for it. He's the bridegroom, as the Bible says. And we're the bride, the church that's living here on, on this earth is an entity that nobody can stop. Nothing can stop it. Because he who opens, no one can shut. He who shuts, can, nobody can open. So you, 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 you're, you're in a... You're in, in great company, actually. And then the last church, let's read that whole thing and we'll talk. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, talking about Jesus, all these are like titles, these titles, the beginning of the creation of God, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have known I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are and, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye solve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And again, as we said in the last while, in the last few weeks, that Jesus visits his church, he does, and he assesses his church, he inspects what's going on with his church, he evaluates it. He died for it, as I said, and he had sent and allowed or anointed gifted people to lead under him. And those gifted leaders better be aware they don't take this church beyond his heart and his plan and his mind. They have to lead very, very wisely. So he, he but nevertheless, he comes all the time. He, like he visits with us when we worship now. He's here, where two or three are gathered in his name. There he is. And uh, for those of you that have uh, received him into your life, you have God's spirit in you, you would have felt him here. You would have acknowledged that he is here, he is with you, he is, in, he is present. So in that sense, he, he's, he presents himself and talks. He would speak like this, but he also speaks through his word. And so what we hear to these churches, uh, he, whatever he says to those churches, we need to take note of it and uh, maybe take some of that as words to us uh, and be be awake and uh, and and wise up to what he might want in this in this in this both these churches i i see one major thing happening and that has to do with the with the door and the promise of an open door god wants to give and sets out an open door like he had opened up the heaven not everybody got an open heaven by the way only those that belong to him Nobody else has that. Nobody else can feel it, know it, understand it, unless they've come to him. You who have come, you know what God's done. You know it, and that's, that's the big thing. You don't need somebody like me even explaining these things to you, because you have it, you know it. The promise of an open door, and then he also says, that door is open for you, and to receive whatever else, now that you've come in, I am the door, you've come in through me, this door will stay open for you. And whatever God has planned for you in your life. I would think that things like that my grandparents prayed for in our lives, and my mother prayed for me, I would think that that opens up doors in our lives. I think, I think we set up for our children. It's not just about you. It's about what you, what, what legacy you're leaving. And Jesus himself has left a legacy of an open door, an open door to heaven. It cost him uh, his life. He went to almost to a hell to, to take the keys away from the enemy, the keys of, of hell and death. It took the keys away from the enemy. And now he has opened up a door for us and uh, we have life. We don't need to die. All of these wonderful positive things are found in these books, by the way. Though sometimes we would focus on that little black dot, our sin, our pain, our troubles. But, but there are some positives coming out of this. But God is saying in this, to this church particularly, this church called Philadelphia, this place called the place of, of friends, fun uh, f having friends in, 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 or, or, or being fondly uh, a people that are fond of each other, love each other, Philadelphia, Phila, Phila, Phileo has to do with being friends and that whole place is a friendly place. And the Lord is saying, listen, I, I, I know you, I know what's going on. I, I want you to know this. I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. You might think that nothing is going on in your life, but when God opened a door for you, nobody can shut it. I know, but sometimes you look funny when you, when you just stand there. Well, I don't know about that. 
Yeah, you're going to have to learn to believe this, right? Things are not working like we want it to work. It seems like some doors are totally shut to us. But the Lord has, has already left a door open for us. And there's, in these two churches, I see the doors and key and, and, and somebody knocking. I, I know a key is often worn by somebody uh, on the shoulder. And those, of the, those people that have possessed official authority and power uh, were and wore a key on their shoulder. And that symbolized, um, that is also symbolized in the New Testament. You see it there. And Jesus, we read in the book of, of Revelation, is, said to, is also said to possess keys, several keys, and one to unlock death, as I said. No more dying, because he's bringing life to his people. Yeah, we're going to leave this world like everybody else in a box. We'll die, but we will, would have been already with the Lord the moment we die. We're not coming back as some ant if you did well badly or or maybe somebody else at another nation if you done well it's yeah wants to die there after the judgment you're not coming back here not coming back here at all nobody's hovering by the way waiting for you to pray properly so they can go to heaven wants to die there after the judgment in Christ absent in body is present with the Lord we have a cloud of witnesses all around us and they are watching hopefully they're watching that's what the scripture says but anyway these guys are there I don't even know if they got time to watch us what we're doing in our sin and how the, I don't know if God is going to allow them to watch us. But I see on Facebook, a lot of people talk with them and, um, and, and they say a lot of things, wonderful things to them. Happy birthday and all that heavenly birthday. Oh man, I don't know, man. Good. God bless you. I hope they're listening and they feel like, what birthday are you talking about? And we've got a party going on all, every day. I don't know. You know, only when you go, you'll find out for sure. Right? But in the meantime, we must, we have the word of the Lord to help us understand what God's doing. And you have the spirit of God in you to acknowledge it, witness. And you find also in the book of Revelation, an angel in Revelation is given uh, keys to, to lock the spiritual cell or the bottomless pit where Satan will be bound for a few years. One angel took care of Satan. Not even God. Hmm? He said, one angel, time up. And the way, you know, Satan is overrated, eh? Overrated. The devil is overrated. And we are, that are in him are under God. We're next in line, if you say it. We're under him. Not even the angels have that authority. And so God gave the key to one guy, one of the angels, go lock him up. When Jesus on the cross had broken the power of the enemy. So the, the, the evidence of the key, it says, I have the key of David. He says, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. The evidence points to a, to a key representing, at least figuratively, the possession of power. Yeah. When you got a key, you have power to come in. Some of you don't have keys to come in, right? But you don't have power. <laughs> that was a joke, but you didn't get it right. And um, yeah, this door is locked. Let me explain the whole joke to you. The door is locked. You can't come in because you don't have a key. If you got a key, you got power. Right, okay. It's a little bit slower. I can't go through that again. So the position of power, you have a key because you have some authority. And God has given you and I some keys. And we need to go back and understand what God's doing and God's saying. But the, the fact that he's given us keys has got nothing to do whatsoever with biblical prophecy. I want to say that, and for some of you it will go over your head, that's fine. But some people need to know that 
a lot of these things have nothing to do with biblical prophecy. They find all kinds of biblical prophetic words uh, in Revelation. This means that, that means that. But God opens the door. That for me is the main thought out of this two books or the two churches this morning. And I felt like the Lord wanted me just to highlight that, bring that before you. See, Moses, uh, Moses, when he brought the people out of the Red Sea, so the Egyptians finally, they decided, you know what, these guys have been there for 400 years, of, you know, in Egypt, and they helped the economy of that whole country. Now they were going, millions of them, three million of them were leaving town. And so the Egyptian king, the Pharaoh, decided, no, 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 we must go get them back. So they followed them. So the army, the whole Egyptian, Egyptian army, are following these farmers that are on, on foot. And, they, and, and God is leading them by the spirit. The cloud by day, pillar by night, pillar of fire by night. God was leading them. And he was taking them to the sea, by the way. Right to the sea. God is leading. Sometimes when, you, when you're being led by the Lord, it feels like you, there's no way further to go. And so when they looked behind them, they saw the Egyptian army. When they looked in front, there was the sea. And they cried out to God. And said, we are going to die here. They cried out and they cried out to Moses. What have you done? And could look, we, we cried. And Moses himself was crying to the Lord. He fell before the Lord. He says, and, and the Lord, one, this one time where God stopped somebody from praying. Yeah, 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 get up. He didn't say it like that, but he didn't quite like that. But I'm my interpretation of it. Hey, get up, get up, get up. Get up. What you got in your hand? I got the staff. It's like a key. See? He says, hold it out to the sea. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> hold it out to the sea. So he took the staff, the stick, his walking stick, held it out to the side. Guess what happened? Sea parted. You know that, right? Sea parted. Everybody's shocked. Now they're going through the sea on dry land. It's dry. Wet sea became dry, parted. He made a way. There's a door. God created a door. Nobody can shut it. God created the door. The Egyptian army continued following them. But these guys had gone out through the sea to the other side. And the Egyptian army followed right up to the edge of the other side, almost. And then God said, Fwaya! and they all died. People might think, ah, that's a far-fetched story. Well, they are finding pieces of, of uh, uh, chariot wheels and other things as uh, archaeology is finding in the Red Sea there. How did it get in there? There was an event. God had opened a way for his people where there was no way. You know, when it's impossible for you, God is able to create a way. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, he said, Jesus, to his disciples. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The word bind and loose actually means shut and open. Close, open. That's what it means. Prohibit, allow. That's what it means. So the church has been given keys and we can, in, the, in his name, as he speaks, shut this up. Open that up. We cry out to the Lord about these things. All the power and authority is resident in Jesus, by the way. But he is the head of the church. And we listen to him. And you can expect it. So in your life, I think, uh, if you're experiencing the Red Sea, there's sea in front of you, enemy behind you, there is no way out. What are you going to do? The Israelites cried out, they cried out to Moses and they began to accuse him. And in fact, their accusation never stopped. Right through their entire 40-year journey, they kept fighting with their leader. Why are you brought us here to die? It's better for us to be in Egypt. There we had the leeks. There we had onions. You like to eat leeks and onions? Really? We had meat. What's this uh, manna we're eating here? Where's water? There's no water. There's no toilet here. There's no Edgar's. Nothing. They fought, they fought. And people, a lot of people's Christianity is based on 
what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and how it's going to be, right? But the Lord is passionate about his people. None, none of their clothes perished in the 40 years. How long you got your shirt? Nothing perished in 40 years. 40 years. They were fine. And in that period, in the desert, God provided water even. Meat. Took care of them. He allows, he opens, he shuts, he gives, he anoints as he will. Whatever he gives will be based on what he wants. And so he operates, you know, when he comes to the church and the people in the church, some people think, well, I don't have any key. Well, you, you're in the Lord, are you not? And if the Lord has given you keys, not everybody gets authority to do certain things. Not everybody gets that. He does it based on what he wants. So he gives people authority. He doesn't operate on a first come, uh, first serve basis or on merit or how long you've been around. If you've been around a long time in the Lord, then you're going to get more. No, everybody gets these things up front. Open heaven, open sky. He got the keys. An open door for you. But you're going to have to go and access it. And I'll tell you in a minute how, what happens. You have to access it. Notice here, if you will, your overcoming, the fact that you overcome stuff in your life, like they had to overcome that Red Sea issue, they had to overcome the other armies that fought with them, they had to overcome the sin and, and the grumbling and so on. Only a few people made it on the other side. In fact, all the people that left Egypt that day, most of them died in the desert. Their children made it across. They made it across. And with your overcoming produces promotion, by the way. Your overcoming. When God leaves you in a place so that you have to learn how to overcome, go through the sea, that overcoming produces a guarantee. It's no guarantee, but uh, it produces promotion. Listen to this verse in verse 12 of Revelation 3. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the name, uh, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. Basically what he's saying, you're mine. I'd make sure that you live close, but you need to learn how to overcome. Learn how to overcome. We have to overcome. So keys have to do with power and authority and the scope of ministry that God gives you. You have to learn how to overcome. If you can't overcome stuff in your own life, in your little locale, unless if you're given something small to do, if you can't overcome that, how are you going to be given a city to manage? Hello? How's that going to work? Would you think that God is able to entrust you with a greater if you can't handle a few things? I don't think any boss uh, worth his salt would allow his uh, employee, no matter how faithful and how good that employee is, employee is, if, if he or she is not, uh, you know, shows, doesn't show um, capacity in doing something. Hey, uh, this go and take care of this thing, please, for me. And he got no idea what to do with that. How is that guy going to manage the entire flow? See, the boss is watching how you overcome, how you learn some things. You think God is not watching? God watches. That's what, he, what, what we're talking about. He comes and he assesses, he evaluates, and he says, listen, this is what's missing. This is what you need to do. This is how you must get this done. And for you that are going to overcome, I'm going to, I'm going to bring promotion. I'm, I, this is my words, but what he says, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him my, the name of my God. To him who overcomes, verse 21 says, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat with my father. So keys, having keys have to do with power, authority, and the scope of ministry. If you can't like deal with, a, a, let's say, a Sunday school class, hmm? how is God going to give you a church to pastor? 
How's that gonna work? Hmm? Can't work. That's a big thing I know, but uh, comparatively, if you can't manage your locale, a small group in your locale, how is God going to give you chats with, let's say? How's it going to work? So God will watch and he wants us to overcome. So the church, and especially church leadership, the angel of the church is required by his decree to point and lay hands on and lay hands off according to his will, how he wants it. Put your hand on this person, set them up for this thing, this is what they must do. Take your hands off this person, they shouldn't be doing that thing. You find it in the Bible, by the way, it's there. So church and church leadership in particular are accountable, as I said last week, they're accountable for all these things, to all, the, to all that happens in the church. We can't just say, oh, it's been here, it's been very long in the church, and therefore, you know. No, they need to learn how to do whatever it is. And God needs to sanction some things. God needs to awake. If the leadership are, are wrong, if the leaders are, sh are, are blind, then we must pray that God will give them eyes to see. Hello? See, that's where faith comes in, because now you believe God will have to do this thing. Pray that God will give them the eyes to see. And then God would. You'd hear your prayer, I'm sure. So the Philip, uh, Philadelphian church was not bad. He says, I, I know your work. See, I've said before you an open door. No one can shut it for you. have little strength, and have, but I've kept my word and I've not denied money. You've got little strength. You're not very strong. You're weak, but still, but in your weakness, you kept my faith. You hung in there. You know, God opens the door and he says, listen, I want you to know things are hard there. Yes, but the door is open for you. It's open. The sky is open. The heavens are open. I love your enthusiasm. We are excited. The, the Laodicean church, on the other hand, the other church we were dealing with, had some very serious issues. What happened there was that they had become lukewarm. None of us have become lukewarm at all. I know that. What is lukewarm? Not hot, not cold. And God even says that. He says, Jesus says, um, you know, I, 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 I've come there and I found you guys are lukewarm. And what he's doing is actually, on one hand, is um, he knows what's going on. See, that city, Laodicea, didn't have local water. Just like us, municipal water shuts in. You know. We have water here, but the thing is, this municipal is, you know. They didn't have water. No local water. So they had to sh uh, pipe in the water by using stone aqueducts coming from Hierapolis, this little city, six miles away. Six miles away. And they found, of course, they found archaeology that would, um, that would uh, uh, confirm all these things. So six miles away, they begin to uh, tap into the water that's there, but the water there was a hot spring. Like uh, how, how that uh, hot water coming out of the, uh, what do you call it, uh, shower tastes so well, so nice. Does it? If you taste the hot water coming out of the shower, <laughs> uh, you want to spit out immediately, right? By that time, that water left that hot spring six miles away and came to them in Laodicea. That was like stale and really not tasting right at all. And the Lord is saying, you have become lukewarm. He's actually is a, is a, is trying to sh share with them something they know. And he says, y'all are tasting that water. It doesn't taste right. Y'all don't like the lukewarm water. And then me now, y'all don't like me as much as I like you. You got your own life to live. You live your life out like you want. You think you got some money. You live your life out like you want, but you forget my passion in my hands will prove that I died for you. But you've come to me, you've taken some stuff and walked away. He says, you've lost your love. He says, I know your works. 
that you are neither cold nor hot. Just like the water you got there. I, I could wish you were cold or hot. Either way, then I know. But then you are lukewarm. It doesn't taste right. Neither cold nor hot. And he says, and so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will what? Vomit you out of my mouth. And this is a hard saying, right? I'm not saying that, but Jesus said that. You look warm, you don't taste right, and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. How that? That book doesn't sell. How that for the title? You are lukewarm. Submitting, you will be vomited. That thing won't sell, that book. Because nobody likes that, right? You know, ask any couple, they'll tell you. The spouse, one of them, any one of them, male or female, will tell you, husband or wife will tell you, they can feel when the other person don't really love them. What do you think? <laughs> the, you can feel it, right? When you know the other person really don't care about you as much. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> you feel, the Lord, the Lord feels this, by the way. He knows when you are lukewarm toward him. Ask yourself, how hot are you for God? And some of you, how cold are you toward the Lord? And then the other group will how lukewarm you think because I have a form of godliness but then I know it's very hard for God I'd like to pray when I want to pray some can't even remember what book I was reading from this week <laughs> by by when you come to the next day you say, what what book was he talking about this week it's so sad if I'm the cook and I've been cooking and sorting things out and you talk about revelation <laughs> and you can't remember it in a day's time Something is wrong, right? Hello? I worry. I worry. And imagine the Lord, he worries. He's thinking, really? And he tells them straight out, you, you look warm. I wish you were either hot or cold. But you're not, anyway, you look warm. I don't like it. Just like how you spit that water out when you drink it, coming from that uh, uh, Hierapolis. In that stony aqueduct. Yeah, you don't like that hot water coming from the hot springs. Now lukewarm. You don't like it. I too am the same way when I see you. That's hard. We should do something about that, right? If your spouse says, uh, says that you, uh, you don't love me really. I mean, you, you love me, but you don't really like me. You know that. How would you know that I really like you? Well, they have their own love language and so on and so on and so on. But uh, you show, you show it. You show it. You're not like indifferent in the house. I know men don't listen. You know, I, I'm accused of that of often. You, know, you didn't hear what I said. Did you hear what I said? Really? You said that? Hmm. But I can also say that of my wife Rani. She's, she don't hear what I say. Hmm? You heard what I said. You did. What did I say first? No. So we have that issue. But we correct ourselves very quickly, right? We get each other's attention. Now, how is the Lord going to get our attention? You tell me. Because he is the one with the key, right? He's the one with the open door. He can make this happen for you in your life. If you're facing a Red Sea, then you go to him when you're in trouble. When you're not in trouble, don't worry about him. I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm telling you. <laughs> that's what we do. So it's important for us to pray about, about, about some of these things. But the, another issue I, I found here is that you find that Jesus is knocking at the door of the church. Imagine that. Same Laodicean church. He was outside the church. You know, if you knock at the door, he wanted to come in where you are. 
It's like your own house. Somebody knocking on the door. Hey, see who's knocking on the door? They don't go look inside. Hey, wait, who's knocking here? They go outside, right? How is Jesus outside his church? Guess what happened there? Their lukewarmness produced that whole situation. Their lukewarmness closed the door to Jesus. Yeah. That's what happened. So Jesus found knocking on the door. How is that the church, churches have Jesus outside? Is that true? Yes, it's true. I can tell you that. And sometimes I would go to some meetings and the Lord is nowhere present. Yeah. You will feel absolutely nothing. God's not there. See, God don't live in this temple, but when we gather, when the people of God gather, he comes. Right? In your own life, this is your temple. He needs to be present here in your life. You will know if he's there. You will know. You will, you will know if somebody else is living in you. You will know it. The spirit of God. Uh, if you don't have any of that, then maybe you don't belong, right? <laughs> what I'm intrigued about in these two churches is the reference to doors and keys and so on. And the key has authority and power. And in one case, Jesus is outside the door. He's knocking to come in. There's no open door for him. And what's really caused his uh, locked door is the people's lukewarmness. They're not hot for God. Now, sometimes when you think that, where is God when I need him? Ask, what was my condition? Maybe my lukewarmness has kept him out. Maybe I don't hear him knocking. He's knocking on the door. He's outside. I want to come in. I want to have you to, I want to eat with you. I want you to eat with me. So Paul, in, 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 in reference to his church, and I'm trying to land, he's saying to the church, one, one of the churches in Colossians, he's asking them to pray for open doors. Pray for me. Pray that God will open doors. And it's important for us to pray for open doors, that we don't take the same door 20,000 other people are taking. In Chatsworth, I like to know which door God is opening. I just don't want to take any door. There's so many wonderful things available to us here in Chatsworth. We can do 10,000 different things. But I want to know for Vineyard Chatsworth, what is the door that God has opened for us? Don't you? I don't want to be going through another door that don't have our name on it. I want our name on it. Hello? I want to be obedient to what God is calling us to do. We can do everything else what everybody else is doing, but we must learn to hear the Lord. So he, he talks to this church. He says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in, in it with thanksgiving. Verse 3 says, meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open us to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains and that I may make it manifest as I ought. He said, pray for me that God will open doors. You just don't go take a door. Well, I, need, I think I need to go to India today. I think I must go to South America. So many doors, got lots of doors everywhere. But it must be a door that God opens for you. And so way to get the door open and some of these things I'm speaking is, goes over your head. Don't be bothered too much about it. But I'd like you to see the other side of ministry as well. Because we need to, we are fighting on a whole different planet. On very different things. And we need to pray about the, the door. And Paul is asking the church, pray that God will open to us a door. Is there a door open for us? And if you take a door that God opens, nobody can shut it. And God will give you the fruit for you. It'll be for him, of course, but for you. You will have it. You know, 15 years ago, uh, we were, we, I was, I felt like 16 years, I think it was, 
sent to Mozambique. Mozambique. Mo Mozambique is a big door. It's a big, big door that God gave us. And God even gave us land, about five hectares of land. We paid for it. It's free. It's got five houses on it. It's got a church building that will seat 300. Very close to the highway is exactly as we prayed that God will open the door. Because I, when I, I was doing conferences in, in the beginning, we didn't have a place to go. We we'll use other people's, like it was Iris Ministry. Uh, they were there um, doing work in, in Dondo, Beira. I would use their facilities. And then I said to the Lord, you know, if you called us here, then please, I, I, need, I, need, I need a property. I need a place where we can go and teach pastors. This is what we're looking for. I want it to be near the road. I don't want to be inside the bush, 100 miles into the bush. I want it close to the highway so I can just get there. And boom, God produced it. 2010, 2009, somewhere there. We have it. It's there. We got now, we didn't have water there. We had some uh, wells, but we piped water there now. We got running water. We didn't have power. We had to get power across the road, the main highway, to get power across the main road. To that property but which is about 100 maybe 200 meters away That's quite quite something and now a community that uh, we're we're gonna station in is about a hundred thousand people there those people will benefit from that line being brought to them so they will now take power from there at their cost to themselves but we become a light do you understand when God opens the door, nobody can shut it. Nobody can shut it. We have about a hundred churches in Mozambique. A hundred. Vineyard churches. Lovely, isn't it? Now we talk about big doors like that. God opens doors so that you and I could go in. Similarly here in Chatsworth, many people are doing many wonderful things. Wonderful things. But I don't want to go and build on somebody else's foundations. I want my own. How about you? I want to know what is mine. How about you? I want to hear from the Lord what he wants for us. That's the kind of a crank leader you got. What can I say? I don't think I want to put money into, I've had so many friends that did serious evangelism in the city, serious. I mean, they booked that stadiums and there were thousands of people that I gave my time, energy and money to it. Many, many, many like that. I eventually found out that nothing actually worked. Nothing actually brought the heads inside the church. I couldn't count people. I said, well, that's it, Lord, then what do you want from me? I'm not going to do that again. What do you want? I don't want to do this again. What do you want? And there were some people wanting to get buses to their churches. In fact, I came out of a church where 10 of those buses. And I know how it is with those people. I've had people, when I go there and hoot for them to come out, the one child will put a head out and say, uh, uh, my mother says she's not coming. Oh, my mother says she's not here. <laughs> How that? We're putting gas in the car, and here's the man. He's coming out. He left his family a long time ago to go and pick you up. That's because transport is provided. And so those days, the people ask you, so you're providing transport. Everything else, you don't need a transport, right? You go to hospital on your own, you go to work on your own, everything, you take a walk. But for church, this entity that actually waits, you know, God, you know, thankfully, some people are giving their money to make this happen. A few people give their money to make this happen. 
I don't want to build buses for nobody. I ran behind the church bus. I think you can run. One lady told me today, I walked. I said, you're going to do you good. It'll benefit you, your health, if you walk to church. If it rains, take an umbrella. Why? Because you're passionate about Jesus. Huh? So don't ask of the Lord and of the church that watch which you won't ask about stuff in your own life. If you don't have a vehicle there, you have to go to checkers, you have to go here and there. You do it by taking Ubers or whatever else. Then Uber to church. God bless you, man. Well, you're not going to get the people here. Well, I can't help it. If they don't come, what can I say? And so when I wanted this building in this place, I mean this land, I said to the Lord, give me something that's near all the buses, all the, all the transportation, and it'll be cool. So we got people, buses all and trains and taxis all around us. When I, did, when I, when I could take a bus and train, I would do it myself, by the way. And it's cool. Nothing wrong with taking a train, a bus. Or Uber. I love you, man. But I'm trying to show you, practically speaking, where our heart is and why it is so hard. Yeah. Let's go and find God. We want God to open doors. Yeah. So when doors don't open, then we can pray for them. Pray that God will open the doors and that we need to be Remaining vigilant only and take those doors that God gives us. So, can I share with you one more scripture and then I'll land? But I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I don't know if I gave you this, I might have. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, you're good, man. Look at that. I gave it to you. What it says, verse number 13, no temptation has taken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, God will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What is that? Make the way, make an open door create a door. God gave me that text a long time ago when um, I was running away from sin, when I did run away from sin, I remember going home and opening to that, I didn't open to that text like that, this would oh Lord speak to me, and I opened to the Bible and then God is saying, you know you ran away today? No temptation has overtaken you such as is common. Everybody, it's common to everybody, he says, but God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted more than you're able. You know, they'll be like, you can't say, you know, the devil made me do it. I've had people tell me that. I didn't sin, but the devil in me sinned. How's that one? Oh, people have told me things. I don't have a name for you, but you know, that I've heard it. God won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. He knows exactly how much you can take. But with the temptation, God will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Look for the open door. When you are really tempted and really in a, in a tight corner, a tight fix. I can tell you a story about this, this particular text, how I ran away. But the Lord is able to share with us. The children are here. They are coming in in the droves. Would you please stand with me? Before they all take over. I want to pray for one thing concerning your life and then I want you to pray for somebody next to you. I want to pray that God will open the door. I want to pray that God will open your door. If the door has been shut this morning, I want to pray that God will open the door. No matter what it is, you put your hand on your heart this morning and say, Lord, I have this need. I have this door. It seems to be shut tightly. God is able to make a way. God is opening doors. He's in the business of keeping doors open for you. 
So we need to pray for the open door. And then I'd like you to also pray for your neighbor, somebody right next to you, at least the Lord bless this person. Maybe you want to put your hand on them lightly just now, but first let me pray for you. Put your hand on your heart. Lord, I pray for each one of my brothers and my sisters here. And Lord, even as we listen to this, this, uh, this scripture from Revelation concerning uh, this Philadelphian church and Laodicean church, there are many, many lessons we can glean from this and learn from it. We ask, Lord, for your, for your guidance and for bringing to our remembrance the things that you, we, we have been taught in your ways. I pray today that we will not give in to the enemy, that we will learn to overcome, that we will get the promotions from the Lord, that God will open the doors and that God will shut other doors that the enemy tries to open. I pray, Father, that you will open the doors that nobody will be able to shut. And I, we pray for that. And I pray for my brothers and my sisters here today that have struggled in their own lives in Jesus' name and those online that listen to this. I pray that the Lord would give you an open door that God will make a way for you like he did in the Red Sea with, with Moses and those people. I pray, Lord, today that you would create a way where there was nothing, where there seemed to be blank. Lord, create for us, bring us through dry land into our, our land of promise, our promised land. I pray your blessings upon each one. I thank you for that work, Lord. And I know, Lord, when we bring these things before you, you hear us. When we come before you and we say, have mercy upon us, help us to, to learn how to be overcomers, and that we would receive from your hand the promotions that you have, uh, have for us. And I pray that great things will be done for us, will be brought into our inheritance and that which you planned for us. Pray your blessings upon your people. This week, I pray, manifest Manifest, Lord, that, that open door. Manifest, Lord, the blessings that they are, uh, we're all expecting and anticipating. Your spirit upon us. Now, would you put your hand on somebody next to you or around you or, or, or maybe don't touch them if you want, don't want to. Just raise your hands out to them and just pray a prayer in your, from your heart. And maybe you want to whisper it or in your, in your heart, in your mind, or even louder. Whatever it is, may the Lord... Bless my brother and my sister. I pray, Father, that as you've done for me, open the doors for my brother, open the doors for my sister. I pray, Lord, take away the stress and the, and the temptations and other things that we seem to be encountering. Lord, that we will not say no to you. We will look to you for that open door. Make a way, I pray for my brother. Make a way for my sister. Open the way. Open the door. Lord God, I pray. Bring hope and life again. I pray, Father, to restore us back to our passion for you. Restore us. Lord, make us hot again in the, in the Lord and for you, Lord. We have a passion for you. May our, our, our love would be fierce, Lord, for you. I pray, Father, bring us back there where we won't be lukewarm anymore. We won't be cold anymore. That we will be hot for you. And I know, Lord, that you don't have to say that to us. That you won't have to say that to us anymore. That we would come and run and pursue you with all our hearts, all our minds. Knowing that you have, uh, Lord, the words of eternal life. So bless your people. Bless us this week. And thank you for my friend, my brother, my sister. Meet their need. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. I hope your prayer works there, huh? Pray, pray about your prayer. This week, God bless you, man. Take care.